Tonight on Brian Ross Investigates, on a week of remembrance for the 3,000 people killed in the 9-11 terror attacks. Mary Jane Booth. An unanswered question. Did the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia secretly help the Al-Qaeda hijackers carry out their plot? Will the U.S. finally reveal the blacked out names in this one secret FBI report detailing how two of the hijackers sneaked into California and were assisted by people connected to the Saudi consulate in Los Angeles. Very significant mounting evidence, powerful evidence, that the Saudis aided and abetted that crime that killed thousands of Americans. Plus, the other victims of 9-11, the first responders, still fighting to get their due, taking on Congress with some powerful help. Your indifference cost these men and women their most valuable commodity. Time is the one thing they're running out of. And our shout out for the investigative reporter in Mississippi, once again challenging the officials who run the state's out of control prison system. And basically even top prison officials have admitted that the gangs are in charge of these prisons. From the Law and Crime Network studios in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigates. And good evening and welcome. A somber week for America, 18 years since the terror attacks that took the lives of almost 3,000 people. And after all that time, one very big question remains unanswered, in part because the FBI and the U.S. government may have kept the answer secret. Did the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia secretly help the Al-Qaeda hijackers carry out their plot? What is the name of the mystery third man blacked out in an FBI report? The Justice Department has just come out with this decision that it will reveal the name and nothing else. We'll be joined shortly by Andrew Maloney to talk about it. Oh, oh my God, another plane has just hit. There were 19 Al-Qaeda hijackers that day of terror in New York and Washington. Much of it played out live on television. You saw a yes, plane? Yes, I just saw a plane go into the building. Among the five on the jet flown into the Pentagon, American Flight 77, were these two, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midhar, both of whom the FBI discovered were helped in coming to the United States by two men from Saudi Arabia who were closely tied to the Saudi consulate in Los Angeles. A once top secret FBI report states that someone whose name is redacted provided or directed others to provide the hijackers with assistance in daily activities, including procuring living quarters, financial assistance, and assistance in obtaining flight lessons and driver's licenses. As part of the lawsuit brought by the families of victims, the FBI and the Department of Justice are now being asked to reveal whose name was kept secret. I'm asking you uh, for a commitment that the FBI will release all of the documents that are relevant to this litigation, that you will not invoke the State Secrets Act, which has been raised as a possibility, and that you will provide full transparency to those families who are simply seeking justice against Saudi Arabia in the face of very significant mounting evidence, powerful evidence, that the Saudis aided and abetted that crime that killed thousands of Americans. Well, Senator, I'm not going to engage on the specific litigation, uh, certainly here in this setting. I can assure you that we will try to be as transparent as I think we can responsibly be, while at the same time protecting national security. The FBI agent who led the Los Angeles investigation, Steve Moore, now retired, filed this declaration in the lawsuit, directly tying Saudi Arabia to the hijackers. Quote, based on evidence we gathered during the course of our investigation, I concluded that diplomatic and intelligence personnel of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia knowingly provided material support to the two 9-11 hijackers and facilitated the 9-11 plot. My colleagues in our investigation shared that conclusion, unquote. And that two Saudi employees in Los Angeles, quote, were active participants in a terror cell associated with al-Qaeda that provided substantial financial and logistical support to Hazmi and al-Midhar. In that document, a third name is blacked out. 
Lawyers for the families have gone to court trying to get it, and today they got their answer. I'm joined here now by Andrew Maloney, one of the lead lawyers for the families of the 9-11 victims. Do you have that name? I do, Brian. What is that name? I, I'm not at liberty to disclose the name. We have agreed to a protective order that the FBI insisted that we uh, agree to so that we cannot reveal information that they've given to us, not only the name that came out today, but for the last year they have given us uh, documents, about a thousand pages of documents, um, some of them very, very useful for us, but I can't share those with not only you, but even with my own clients. Um, so they have continued to clamp down and put the shroud of secrecy over everything we do in the case. Um, I heard Director Ray say he wanted to be transparent or as transparent as possible. Why then have this protective order? Why then can we not tell the American public or our own clients what we've learned so far? Is there anything you can tell us about the name? Is it something that came as a surprise to you? No, it was a name we were familiar with. All right. A question for you from our control room from executive producer Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda, what's your question? The Saudi government has fought you for 18 years on this. We invited their lawyer to come on, and he declined to talk about the, quote, ongoing case. Why are they fighting you so hard? What are the implications of this? Well, if we prove that the Saudi government was behind the 9-11 attacks, that is uh, essentially a declaration of, of war. Um, we invaded two countries after September 11th attacks. Um, Saudi Arabia has been long considered an important ally for the United States. But frankly, they need us more than we need them. And they need to come clean. They need to cooperate. They need to comply with discovery that we've demanded. They've given us next to nothing in the formal discovery process that's ongoing in court. They continue to change their story about who was doing what and what they were in terms of their uh, employees that were here in the United States. So nothing you've learned today dissuades you from your theory? D quite the opposite. It continues to corroborate and give us more rocket fuel to, to, to get this case to the finish line. There's one theory that the Saudis were working with the CIA perhaps to launch an undercover investigation, try to infiltrate al-Qaeda and turn these two al-Qaeda members to cooperate. I've heard that rumor. Um, I don't see any evidence of that. It's a convenient thing for the Saudi officials to say. I think Prince Bandar, former ambassador to the U.S., and Prince Turkey, the former head of Saudi intelligence, have said that they knew who the hijackers were, that they knew the names, that they knew that some of them had come to the United States. They claim uh, that they told the CIA. Um, we don't have evidence of that. The CIA was purportedly tracking two of these guys while they were in Malaysia. Uh, but beyond that, um, we don't have any evidence that the, C that the CIA or FBI uh, was aware of what they were up to in the United States. But it's very telling that Saudi high-level officials have said we knew who they were. And they had Saudi employees, Saudi government employees in Los Angeles and San Diego assisting these two future hijackers on a daily basis to get them acclimated to American society, to provide a support network. And you can't have it both ways. If you're the Saudi government and you say we knew who they were, and then later in our litigation claim that the help they were provided was innocent help, and there's no way you can prove that, these, that the help they were getting from Saudi officials was with knowledge and intent. And you got the name today at what time? Four o'clock. From the Department of Justice? Yes. And now what's the next move for you then? Well, we are happy to have gotten the name, but there's a lot more in the 2012 report that the name comes from, and a lot more beyond that that we're seeking. And we have long sought, we subpoenaed the FBI 18 months ago. And uh, as I indicated, they did give us some information, but they've withheld a lot of other information. So taking the 2012 report alone, that's the four-page document that you have, there's all, quite a bit of additional material in that report that's been redacted. We want that. And we were told today by the Attorney General that he was exercising his privilege of declaring it a state secret and a matter of national security 18 years after uh, the events that took place. Um, he is claiming that we can't have it because it jeopardizes national security. To me, that's another way of saying, yes, it's the Saudi government. We can't rock the boat. Andrew Maldi, thank you so much for joining us. Much more to come on this story, obviously. You've led the way in the information, and you're doing a great job. Coming up next... The other victims of 9-11, the first responders who ran into danger inhaling deadly toxins, their heartbreaking fight to get their due when we come back.
Next, a little good news. Medical bills and compensation for the 911 first responders and survivors has now been assured by Washington. Nearly 25,000 claims for the Victims Fund have been approved, and some 14,000 more are pending for those who breathed in the deadly toxins in the aftermath of the attack. Captured so bravely in this amazing footage by CBS photojournalist Mark Laganja. To me, it sounded like a jet flying over. That's why I panned up. And then you see the tower collapsing. down. There was no doubt about what happened and why so many became ill or died. But it took some very public shaming of members of Congress by comedian John Stewart and the dying victims themselves to get it done this summer. And it would be one thing if their callous indifference and rank hypocrisy were benign, but it's not. Your indifference cost these men and women their most valuable commodity, time. It's the one thing they're running out of. We're joined now by two very knowledgeable guests on this subject, David Icebrook, one of the many lawyers who represents the 9-11 victims, and Dr. Lee Wilson, who's the medical director for the Northwell Queens World Trade Center Health Program. Thank you both for joining us. Dr. Wilson, let me start with you. What is it they're suffering from? Is it cancer? Is it in the lungs? So thanks so much for asking. So if you think about in the early days after 9-11, most of the illnesses that were being seen were directly related to the inhalation or ingestion of the dust, uh, nasal passages, lungs, um, ingestion, so acid reflux and those sorts of diseases. You know, over time there was a concern that people were exposed to many known and probable human carcinogens. Uh, most people are familiar with asbestos, but there are a number of other um, probable human carcinogens in the, in the dust. So um, we do cover conditions, like I was saying, from the early days, the sinuses, um, the reflux, and conditions related to the lungs, but we also cover many cancers as well. David Iceberg, is there enough money to cover all of these health issues? This goes to 2090? There is now. This is an uncapped fund, Brian. So. The fight was to reauthorize the bill and extend the limits to cover any claims made through 2090. The World Trade Center Health Organization that the doctor is involved in had already been authorized, extended to 2090. Actually, in the prior bill, um, claims could be made up until 2090, but the funds, the money, the compensation for these people was running out. So that's why John Stewart was the stalwart of the um, of fight to extend this. and. As a, a true bipartisan vote, one of the few bipartisan bills to be voted through under this administration, maybe absent some criminal bills, um, it was a 97 to 2 vote uh, to extend it. And now it's an uncapped fund, so there will be money to pay uh, victims through 2090. The two Republicans who voted against it, uh, Rand Paul of Kentucky and Mike Lee of Utah, said it's too much money. There's no limit on this. Well, Rand wanted what he called um, a paid-for exception. For all the money that was paid into the fund for injuries, he wanted it to be allocated from a certain area. He wanted it to be paid for by some type of revenue stream uh, from Congress. Uh, the other senator, he had a problem with the, um, the years. He wanted it capped. And uh, it was a strong fight to, against that, and it is an uncapped uh, extension. Dr. Wilson, is there a way to treat these victims? Uh, can they be saved? Are they all doomed? <laughs> I, um, absolutely, there's treatment. Um, most patients are getting conventional uh, treatments as appropriate for their cancers. Um, thankfully, we have funding from the World Trade Center Health Program to cover patients whose cancers meet the latency and exposure criteria as set forth by the government. Why is it carry out to 2090? So um, this actually is more applicable to what we call the survivors, so the folks that lived and worked um, in the designated area because there were children um, and younger folks there. My, my 
cohort or my group of responders most likely will not be around till 2090. Sorry, guys. What's their, their morale about all this? They feel they, the government's finally recognized, America's recognized what their contribution was? Most, most people genuinely appreciate, um, you know, as they, they know that they either volunteered or were sent down to Ground Zero on 9-11 to serve their country, most of them definitely appreciate that uh, there is funding to take care of them. David, when your clients, though, is there an anger about this? There, there is an anger, especially on the uh, clients uh, where the spouses have passed and they have now you know, found out after so many years, uh, especially when the initial direction was it was safe to go back in the area. And as the doctor mentioned before, that you know, the fumes that they were inhaling um, were cancerous. Um, and I just want to, if we have 15 seconds, just it's important that people know anyone, doesn't have to be a first responder, anyone who lived or worked below Canal Street for the eight months following 9-11 is eligible for the fund. If you develop a cancer or a respiratory illness, any time from now through 2090. So there's room for new claims then? The, the fund was extended purely for new claims, that anybody, even children who live down there who develop cancer when they're 50, when they're 60, they may have been five or 10 years old at the time, are now eligible for compensation up to 70 years from now, especially people who were exposed to asbestos and the latency period there could be 30, 40, 50 years for asbestos. They may not develop it until the year 2060, 2070, they're eligible for compensation. There are new claims coming in every day. And Dr. Wilson, quickly, you're seeing them, you're giving them hope? I do my best to give people hope. Um, I try to focus on the positive when people come in. Um, and you know, I, like I always say, I like to see people when they're well, as well as when they're sick. <laughs> but um, yeah. we do try to, our best to keep things positive. Well, Dr. Lee Wilson and David Eisbrook, thank you so much for joining us. Right, very thank you. important, and thank you for your very good work, both of you. Thank you. Up Thanks next, our shout out for the veteran Mississippi investigative reporter whose stories have once again revealed chaos inside the state's horrid prisons when we return. And our shout out tonight is for a veteran reporter who has now become his own boss and his own editor. Jerry Mitchell has created the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting and continues to stir things up, as you will see, going back, following up on old stories to make sure officials keep to their promises to make things better. It all started with a cell phone call from an inmate back in 2013. Hey, I want to tell you about all the corruption that's going on inside the prison and all these beatings and various things that are happening and nothing's being done about them. It was a call to action for investigative journalist Jerry Mitchell six years ago, leading to a damning expose in the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi, and a series of supposed reforms in the state prison system. And all of a sudden, I keep getting reports of things getting worse. So once again, Mitchell is on the case, now turning up evidence of how the understaffed prisons are really being run by criminal gangs. In lockdown, we joined the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting and ProPublica to investigate critical understaffing. This video obtained by the Marshall Project shows what officials call a gang-ordered murder on an inmate, seen running from his attackers trying to get away, trapped in a shower cell, stabbed 10 times, and left for dead. One of four gang killings inside this prison alone. It's a horrible situation, and basically even top prison officials have admitted that the gangs are in charge of these prisons. So we've uncovered all these things of how gangs control how prisons operate. How did it come to be that the gangs, not the warden and the guards, run the prison? Well, if you don't have enough officers, like if at night, if all you have is a tower officer and really no what they call floor walkers, um, I mean, we exposed in South Mississippi Correctional Institution time after time this happened. So, as a journalist, this is a real challenge because you can't be inside there. Exactly. You have to rely on them talking yes. to you. And can you trust their accounts? How do you verify and double check yeah. what they tell you? That, that's a great, well, you, you piece it together. You use inmates, you use um, reports, you use um, incident reports and things like that. You use correctional officers who work there. Um, really to kind of get a picture. I love 
I love reporting on hidden worlds, and this is like one of them. It's become a big issue in Mississippi. This cell phone video surfaced last week. And once again, Mitchell's investigative reporting is making waves in Mississippi. In part of the prison on fire. Investigate TV have uncovered alarming staff shortages at prisons across the country. There is simply not enough manpower in place to keep tabs on the more than 3,000 inmates that are housed there. Back at it again, Brian. Uh, yeah, they, they're, they're not happy with them. a lot of silence. Uh, most of this time, you know, they've kind of just circled the wagons. But prison officials have acknowledged the problem. When you don't have the appropriate level of staff, you know, safety is a concern. Before his new series on prison exposés, Mitchell made big news when he obtained this photograph of three Mississippi college students posing with guns in front of the bullet-ridden sign commemorating the death of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African-American who was lynched in 1955 after being accused of the rape of a white woman. I had a friend of mine say, this looks like a trophy shot, so instead of a, you know, a 10-point buck, they're standing in front of the Emmett Till sign, you know. It's just very disturbing. The three students, all members of an Ole Miss fraternity, were suspended. Another black eye for Mitchell's home state. As a reporter, you don't, you know, you're... Your obligation is not to protect somebody's reputation. It's our, ours is to tell the truth. So you're really filling a huge gap in local investigative journalism. We really feel we are, Brian. It's an important thing. I, uh, I know you feel and I feel, you know, investigative reporting is, is so key. It's uh, so important to our democracy to, to make it work right. We have to know. Uh, Citizens have to have knowledge of what's really going on. Indeed. So our shout out tonight for Jerry Mitchell and the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting and all those who have supported it, including our own executive producer, Rhonda Schwartz, who serves on the center's board. That's our program for tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here next week.